So if I seem a little uncomfortable today, or perhaps I'm sweating a little bit more than normal, it's because that we have Dr. Frank Luntz in the house, one of the world's most renowned communications specialists. Am I doing okay? <laughs> Tap me if I need to pause for effect, okay? Frank has been dubbed the Nostradamus of pollsters by Sir David Frost, and one of <laughs> supposed to tap my leg, man. People aren't supposed to see that. And one of 50 America's most promising leaders aged 40 and under by Time Magazine. Business Week calls him one of the four top research minds. He has written, supervised, and conducted more than 2,000 surveys, focus groups, and ad tests and dial sessions in more than two dozen countries and on four continents in the past decade. Frank is the go-to consultant for Fortune 100 companies and their CEOs who, needs commu who need communication help and guidance, much like me right now. From General Motors to FedEx to Disney to American Express and from AT&T to Microsoft, all those CEA CEOs have Frank on speed dial. In addition to being a political pollster for several TV networks, he has certainly been on virtually every talk show on almost every network. If you please join me in welcoming him today's guest speaker, Dr. Frank Luntz, communication guru. And actually, I want to do this from down there. I don't want to do it from up here. I want to challenge some of the stuff that you guys do to ensure that you never, ever invite me back again. <laughs> but the reason why you're going to want to have me back is the fact that this organization sponsors a table for young people, I think is great. And so I want to kick it off because I don't want you guys to leave today. So even though I'm only down in Florida two or three times, I'll make a commitment for one of the speeches that you do, Manny, when you're in charge, that I will sponsor a table for the students here from uh, Florida. <laughs> but I want you to do the same. And you guys back there, think of what your question's going to be, because I'm going to give you a couple of them. So I'm, gonna, I'm giving you the warning now to prepare. Uh, it's hot as hell. How do you live here in the summer? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's June, and, and I really want to take off this clothing, but then you'd realize that I really am fatter than I look on television, <laughs> which is how I was greeted when I came here. Wow, TV really does add 20 pounds. So, and I added the 20 pounds before TV did. Now, you can see that if those of you, if I walk by, you'll notice that I'm wearing some pretty cool shoes, and this is kind of what I do. And I'm now killing your question for the end, but this is, because I'm looking down, and people are looking, and I can tell they're thinking, this guy's fat. And it wasn't the, when the Boston Globe, it wasn't the hottest pollster. It was actually quoted as the fattest pollster. <laughs> and so I wear these sneakers. And the reason why is because people will point at me and they'll go, well, you have gained a lot. Look at those shoes. <laughs> and so it diverts attention. Uh, I want to show you a, lo a lot of language. I'm going to show you some of the best and worst. And I'm going to focus on business. If you want to bring me into politics, I'm willing to do it. But I want to try to also instruct you as to language that works for the business community, because I think it'll be helpful for you as you take it with you. And I'll answer any political questions that I was specifically told, which bothers me, I am not allowed to do political jokes, that we have become so divided, that we've become so brittle, that we can't make fun of each other anymore. We can't, we have to be so careful about what we say. I used to be able to tell people that of all the places Hillary Clinton could choose to live, she chose Chappaqua, New York. Do you know Chappaqua is Indian for separate bedrooms? <laughs> I can't tell that joke anymore. <laughs> or that the McDonald's that's on that causeway, right, what, what is it, like eight-tenths of a mile from here, has that brand new Barack Obama Happy Meal. Order anything you want, and the guy behind you has to pay for it. <laughs> you guys said I can't tell that joke anymore. Or that John McCain is so old, it takes him an hour and a half to watch 60 Minutes. <laughs> His favorite painting is The Last Supper. Look carefully, he's the second waiter from the left. <laughs> or that John Kerry, our new Secretary of State, looks just like the tree that threw apples at Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Can't do those jokes anymore. So let me talk to you a little bit about trust. And the difference here is that I'm not going to wait until Q&A. If you've got a question, ask. 
We have become a very interactive society, and we don't like sitting and waiting. We want our answers now, and I want to give you whatever answers you want as we go through this. And you're going to just have to give me like a five-minute warning, because I'm going to just keep going and going and going until you stop me. The most important attribute right now is not brand. It is trust. And it is so hard to get. As I'm going to show you, the numbers for politicians, media, business people, sports is so low. We don't trust anyone in anything. How many pictures are you going to take? <laughs> and I see her, she's putting wide angle, wide angle. <laughs> You're hurting my feelings here. Shoes. <laughs> so first thing I want to do, I want you to tell me, does the frog live or die? Does the frog live or die? Who says the frog lives? Raise your hands. Who says the frog dies? Raise your hands. If you think the frog lives, stand up. If you think the frog lives, stand up. Okay, no one else can now get up. You are correct. The frog does live. No, nope, don't sit down yet. I want you to tell me why the frog lives. You're first. Why does the frog live? Why did the gator let him sit there that long if he was going to kill him? Okay, what word answer would have done fine? I think the word trust might be the answer. No, that's the second answer. Both are wrong. Sit down. Why does the frog live? The frog jumps. The frog jumps. The frog does not jump. Down. Why does the frog live? Nimble, not as fast as an alligator. Down. Why does the frog live? One of those hands? Oh, come on, you can do better than that. No, down. Why does the frog live? Trust. Trust, then there'd be a very dumb frog. No. <laughs> Why does the frog live? That's right, because of the way the alligator carries his baby. Okay, that's disgusting. <laughs> down. Why does the frog live? Okay, alligator's fake. You're close, but down. Why does the frog live? You, so even though that she's wrong, you still gave the same answer. <laughs> now I know why you couldn't figure out how to vote in 2000. <laughs> why does the frog live? No you have no idea? Get your ass down. <laughs> why does the frog live? I'm thinking maybe it's a plastic alligator. You just heard that that's not the answer. <laughs> they need those miracle ear things down here. Why does the frog live? The color of the frog is just crazy, crazy. The color of the frog, what are you, a racist? Yeah. Down. <laughs> Why does the frog live? That may be the case, but it's still not the right reason. Why does the frog live? You're still wrong. Why does the frog live? Someone's got to get it. Because the alligator didn't close its mouth. Okay, no, that's not the answer. Sit down. And don't heckle from the second row. Why does the frog live? Poisonous. No, that would just make it a disgusting tasting frog. Why does the frog live? I gotta stay away from there. Teeth miss. Teeth miss him? No. Three more attempts. Come on, someone's gotta get it. Ma'am, why does the frog live? Because the man's jealous of it. Because of that frog. Uh, no. Uh, that, actually, you're correct, but that's not why the frog lives. Why does the frog live? The gator's, dead. gator's dead. Good for her. She gets it. Good for you. And according to Manny, you get a whole year freeze membership in this. I want you to look at everything. I want you to see everything. It is not what you say that matters, it's what people hear. And you have to be observant. Look at the, look at the alligator's eyes. It's, it's, not, it's dead. We miss so much that comes to us because we don't pay attention to it. We don't focus on it. We're so focused on what we're going to say that we miss what people are telling us. We're so focused on the obvious that we don't see the subtle. And that's what I want to try to challenge with you. In terms of levels of trust, now you guys know that I'm, for those of you who know what I do, I come from right of center. Barack Obama has got more trust than any other political person, than any other institution. But even at number one, only one third of Americans have a good amount of faith and trust in him. By the way, look how bad. The Fortune 500 CEOs are actually below the IRS. <laughs> Who here is a CEO in this room? Raise your hands. Get out. 
it's so, and we're actually telling people that you need to change the name CEO, that you should be a business leader, that you should be a president, that you should be a chairman. But CEO's got such a bad, and, and the reason why? When you hear business leader, people think problem solver. When they hear the word CEO, they think profit over people. They think layoffs and, and furloughs, and they think budget cuts. A CEO is about money. A business leader is about getting things done. And it's important. I know that there are people here from the chamber or maybe the business roundtable, whatever business you're in, a CEO is what they think of when they think of Wall Street. A business leader is what they think of when they think of Main Street. And so it's important to change that language. And by the way, look at the difference. In terms of America's largest companies, that's not such a great number, but it's not so bad. It's a positive 22% advantage. Half of Americans favorable. Look what happens when you ask them about the CEOs. It's less than a third. We are so negative towards the business community, and we got to figure out a way to change it. These, I love this slide. 86% of the country trusts a business leader more than they have a CEO. You've got to change the title. And this is Vistage because you're all CEOs here. Like your whole table, you should be on your cell phones, sending an email to your offices, and change your business card. Because you may think it's a level of respect, and to a small segment of society, and the people in this room, it probably is. But for the average American, it's not. Uh, keep, oh, by the way, political leaders, you know how bad political people are. Business leaders beat political leaders. You know, Congress, Congress has an 11% favorability rating. Who here has a positive opinion towards Congress? Raise your hands. We have two women over here, and, you're, and your spouse is a member from what district? 11% favorability. Gaddafi had a 15% favorability, and that was among the people who killed him. I told that joke to a group of U.S. senators. Not a single one of them laughed. And I didn't, I thought, okay, they don't like the joke. And then when I talked to them afterwards, I realized they were actually thinking, oh my God, if I actually go meet my constituents, what's going to happen to me? It really is. It has become that negative. The number one attribute for the business community, problem solver. You're all about, so you're all about solutions. You're all about results, and that's what needs to be communicated. Okay, I'm going to get to some language here, too. This is the coolest phrase. If I tell you, and I don't know if there are reporters in here, if I say to you, I want you to remember only one thing, or if you remember only one thing from this speech, remember this. Everybody will start to write down what comes next. It is a great technique, and I'm amazed at how few people use it. It is alerting people that whatever the next phrase is really does matter. I'm going to have a bunch of those today. And the thing I want you to remember is this right here. The number one American value. Now I know how far I, I can, I'm sorry, I can't get any closer to you all because of that thing right there. I've now, I feel like a dog. I've now marked off my territory. <laughs> even more than family, even more than community, even more than fairness, the thing that we relate to most as Americans is hard work. For those of you who are running for office or will run for office at some point in your life, and for those of you who are leaders within the community, hard work is the ultimate American value, and we need to talk about how we respect it, how we appreciate it, how we reward it, and how we have to stop punishing it. You want this country to be strong for the next generation? You, you explain to this generation, to that table over there, that hard work is an American value, and all good things come from those who work hard. And let me show you this. You know that politics, they talk about the middle class all the time. Middle class this, middle class that, when in truth, we care more about hardworking taxpayers than we do middle class. And I'm gonna show you why right now. How many of you in this room think you're middle class? Raise your hands. Okay, bullshit. <laughs> I saw the cars coming in here. I'm trying to figure out which one I'm gonna steal or which six or 10. One more time, raise your hand if you're middle class. See, less hands go up when I do that. Now, raise your hands if you're a hardworking taxpayer. Do you see the difference? I couldn't get these guys to pay attention. I couldn't get Mitt Romney to pay attention. I'm being serious now. 
I tried. I was in one function where he was there and I had a chance to speak before he spoke. And I did exactly what I did here. And still, he spoke about the middle class. The middle class is divisive because then we're fighting over who gets the benefits. But we are all, almost all, hardworking taxpayers. Why are we dividing by class in this country at this time in 2013 when we are all united in the fact that we do not trust the IRS? <laughs> it's just, it's been a, a great frustration of mine. Here's another example. And I say this because a whole lot of you are small business owners or work for small business here. Still, by a three to one ratio, we'd rather be fighting for hardworking taxpayers than fighting for small business. I'm gonna show you one other example of this. I hear politicians all the time talking about uh, uh, economic growth, economic growth. The problem with economic growth is that it's an academic term. Economic growth is something that people from Harvard and MIT talk about. What we want is healthy schools, healthy neighborhoods, healthy families, a healthy economy. These are things that we aspire to because if it's healthy, it means it's working and it's working right. A healthy economy is so much more preferred than economic growth. And when you compare it to the business climate, 8119, I don't know any issue, any language where more than 80% agree with one position. And yet you still see politicians in Washington talking about let's improve the business climate. And it's just not relating to the average American. So, question for you all. And these are the two most powerful questions I possibly can ask. I know it's weird because I'm supposed to take questions and instead I'm asking them. Two questions for you. And these are the two most important questions you could ever ask your employees, your friends, your neighbors, your community. How many in this, in this room are better off today than your parents were when they were your age? Overall, who's better off than your parents? Look around. Keep your hands up and look around the room. Okay, put them down. Now tell me the truth. How many of you believe your kids will be better off? Not that you want them to be. How many of you believe your kids will be better off than you when they get to be your age? Raise your hands. And once again, look around at how few hands are up. That was the American dream. That was the American promise that our grandparents or great-grandparents came from another country. They had nothing, and they worked in the most awful jobs so that our grandparents could maybe go to college, so that our parents could be successful, so that we could do the same thing for our kids. And look at how few of you. And by the way, if it's not working here in this community, I wonder if it's working anywhere. This frightens me. When we have lost that sense of intergenerational improvement, and by the way, there's a difference between men and women. And I get into trouble for this, and what the hell. <laughs> I know the men in here love your spouse and you love your kids. I know that, I understand that, so don't argue with me. But 70% of you judge your success by your career. I know the women in this room love your career and appreciate your professional life. But 70% of you judge your success by the health and happiness of your children. There are exceptions to all of this. I'm trying to figure out how to say it so I don't get yelled at, because I used to have people heckle me. I had a woman standing up in the back and say, you're so full of it, I don't care about my kids. And I responded, clearly you don't. <laughs> I've never been, I mean, when she started yelling at me that her kids don't matter, I'm like, we gotta take away those kids. <laughs> and so when a woman says that her kids aren't gonna have a better life than her, do you realize she's saying that she's in pain for her family? And that is what the anger and the frustration and the divisiveness is in this country. It's not just about what's happening today. It's also about our expectations for the future. And in fact, look at the pipe chart on the right. Only 16% think it's going to be easier for their kids to succeed. 72% harder. And this explains, because this is always the question I get, why are people so angry today? They're angry because they have to make sacrifices, and they're angry because they're struggling. But the sacrifices are different depending on whether you're a mom or a dad. Dads are all about stuff. If I'm watching people getting out of cars, almost inevitably, the dad's getting out of the sports car, the dad's getting out of... The dad is looking at things and wants to make sure that their children have all the things they possibly can. The moms 
want to make sure their children have all the experiences they possibly can. So dad's nervous because he can't give his kids what some other dad gave. And moms are nervous because they want to make sure their kids have the right things as they grow up in life. And she's not sure if she's able to provide them. And when you combine both of those, 72% of Americans are mad as hell and, can't, and, and don't, can't take it anymore. And by the way, if Nancy Pelosi has one more facelift, that's what she's going to look like. <laughs> I will hear it in your comment card shortly, I'm sure. <laughs> and she, and it, she heard, I told that joke, she heard it, and she says, how can you make fun of me? You're fat. I said, I know I'm fat. What's the point? <laughs> These are the five attributes that matter most. This is the only time I'm coming up on stage. And by the way, I hate that podium. For those of you who have to communicate, you stand behind a podium. They don't see you. They don't feel you. They don't get you. You have to be as close to your audience as you possibly can be, particularly now. We don't trust people who read speeches. I, you know, I give Barack Obama credit. I really do. He is the best teleprompter reader we have ever had. <laughs> Mitt Romney? Stevie Wonder read a teleprompter better than Mitt Romney. <laughs> I made up that joke, by the way. I've stole a few of these jokes I've stolen. There are two that I made up. That's the one I made up, and then the other one. Uh, if Hillary Clinton had been elected president, she would not have been our first female president. Jimmy Carter was our first female president. <laughs> you may hiss now, but you will retell it later. <laughs> these are the five attributes that matter most. When you ask people, what do you want more of that you don't have enough of? For those of you taking notes, of all the slides I present, it's not the words, it's understanding what's behind them that matters. And these are the attributes that matter most in society. We want fewer hassles, more choices, more money, more time, no worries. These are the things we don't have enough of and we want more of. Y'all take a look up there. Now everybody stand up, including our front table. Let's see who really understands American men and American women. Let's start with our survey of American men, but you're all participating. What do men want more of that they don't have enough of? Who says their number one choice? <laughs> what did she say? Sex. Who said it? And she raises her hand. I gotta see what she looks like. <laughs> Raise your hand again. Check your shoes. Uh, you know what? But wait, first off, I do the jokes here. <laughs> but secondly, it's funny you say that because actually more sex, I didn't do it. You know what? I actually chose not to do the joke because I didn't think you'd find it funny. But it is true. Women, men chose more sex as their third highest priority. Women chose it as their eighth highest priority, <laughs> which is why men chose it so high. I'll let you think about the consequences of that. So who said men chose fewer hassles as their highest priority? Raise your hands. Not a single person in this room. Oh, one person. You must have just got married. Sit down. Uh, who said men chose more choices as their highest priority? Who said men chose more money as their highest priority? Who says men chose more time as their highest priority? If your hand is up, sit down. Who said men chose no worries as their highest priority? If your hand is up, we're not pathetic. Sit down. <laughs> Only the people still standing. Now, what's the highest priority for women? Who says more money? Who says fewer hassles? Down. And with a shirt like that, you shouldn't get up. <laughs> uh, who says women chose more choices as their highest priority? Down. Who said women chose no worries as their highest priority? Down. Only the people still standing, which is a very high percentage, and some of the students back there got it right, correctly identified that men want money and women want time. So congratulations to you who got it right. You can all sit down. Good for you. But this is, what, this is what you communicate for your business. And by the way, even our definition of the American dream has changed. The American dream used to be about freedom. The American dream used to be about opportunity. Now it's about money. 
some smart person in here, one segment of American society chooses home ownership as the definition of the American dream for them. Which one? What do you think? Any guesses? Not men? Not middle class? What was that? Divorces. <laughs> What the hell? <laughs> Are you divorced? You're gonna be. <laughs> Latinos. Latinos choose home ownership. I have to get to it because I can tell you're never gonna get to the answer. So, Anheuser-Busch creates the most amazing ad, and it's actually really, really cool. This young woman, she it only aired on Univision because they understood this. And I tell you this ad because I want you to create advertising that reflects to your communities, the people you're trying to reach. And I'm going to show you a couple of those ads. This young woman, she's got a plant under one arm and she's got a suitcase under another and she comes into her living room and she's in tears. She's crying and her mother's crying and even her father's upset because she's leaving home for the last time. Remember the importance of home ownership. So she goes out the door, shuts it behind her, goes down the stairs into the street, across the street, up the stairs to the house, right across the street from her parents, <laughs> opens the door, there's no furniture inside, goes to the refrigerator, there is one six-pack of Budweiser. She holds up the bottle to the, to the camera and she says, Mi casa. If you're a Latina, living across the street from your parents is the American dream. I'm Jewish. <laughs> living across the street from my mother, <laughs> let me get to the punchline. You're mean. <laughs> Who here is Jewish? Raise your hands. Don't raise your hands. <laughs> Have you not learned anything from history? <laughs> Every time someone has asked you that question, it hasn't worked out for you. <laughs> Have you seen the movie? Our character doesn't make it to the end. <laughs> Oy. Or as I should say down here, Oigewald. Uh, peace of mind, the number one value that we're looking for in our lives. I'm going to give you three words to shortcut this. Peace of mind we want in our lives, respect we want in our business, in our employee relationships, and accountability is what we want in our government. Peace of mind, respect, <coughs> accountability. And the four things that we're looking for from Washington, accountability, personal responsibility, efficiency, and effectiveness. Accountability, so they look you straight in the eye and they say what they mean and mean what they say. Personal responsibility, so they don't make promises that they don't keep. Efficiency, so they spend your money as carefully as if it were your own. And effectiveness, because in the end, the reason why we look to government is for results. Not spending, not effort, not intent, but results. Those four attributes matter for government, and the three attributes matter for us in our lives. And what we want more than anything else in life, other than opportunity, is the good life. Look how low the American dream comes in right now. Only 22% prioritize it, compared to a lot more that choose the good life. And I want to explain this to you, because it's also about peace of mind. There are 500 people in this room. Every one of you has a different definition of the good life. And each one of you is correct. The good life, and I'm going to do this, and, and I don't see that there's a microphone, so I'm going to have to repeat your answer. Stand up. What is the good life for you? I want you to tell me where you are, specifically where you are, <coughs> who are you with, and what are you doing? Uh, the good life is actually the name of my boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's not, it's not the name of his boat, it's the, the name of his boat. <laughs> How many vowels does boat have? <laughs> He's the kind of guy who doesn't say Jew, he says Jew. <laughs> I die, basically, in households like his. Okay, it's the name of your boat. How big's your boat? Uh, 39 feet. Oh, God. How old are you? 30. What? Oh. His boat is older, is bigger than his age. <laughs> that, like, to me is the, and, and what do you do that you have such a... A uh, nice boat. Medical real estate. Well, which medical real estate, which means? Medical office buildings on hospital campuses. And I guess it's, is it a good business? Very good business. Is it a cash business? Uh, yeah. It is. Oh, no, not cash business. Oh, no, it's not. 
do, do not go before the IRS. Do you pay your taxes? No. I mean, yes, that's not. Okay, so he's living the good life. Help me. Stand up for one second. Um, where are you? What are you doing? And who are you with that defines for you, that you envision when you see in your head the good life? Where are you? As far as what I do for a living? No, where are you? What's the good life? What is the best place on earth? What is peace of mind to you? Um, being healthy and having. Where are you located? Oh, Florida. You're in Florida. Mm -hmm. With this heat? Yes. <laughs> this humidity? Love it. You're going straight to hell, you know that. Uh, okay, where in Florida? I love Palm Beach County. Oh, God, you're so Florida boring. Nice. Okay, you get two more shots at this. Okay, sorry. Who are you with? As far as work or personal? The good life. <laughs> Could you write this down for her? As long as you're not a teacher, I'll feel okay. The good life, who are you with? I'm with my family. Which family? My husband and my children. Are you with your in-laws? Not too long a pause. <laughs> are they here right now? No. If they were here, would you tell them that you were with them? No. no. Wow. Okay, so at least you're honest. So tell us, what don't you like about your in-laws? No, that's a different, <laughs> different. And, and what are you doing in the good life? Um, I'm volunteering and working with organizations and trying to make a better life for others. Awesome. That's, that's, that's a really positive, forward-thinking, Community oriented. Oh, she's with organizations. She's volunteering. She's working for communities, working for charities. So good for you. Now I don't have to frighten you anymore. <laughs> so basically, she's a good person because she's volunteering, and he's a bad person because he's on his boat. <laughs> Whatever good life you have, and it's funny because I picked you out because I actually figured, but I had n I'd never met him before, and I will sink your boat this evening. <laughs> My brother, watch out. Actually, you guys do look alike, but he looks younger than you. He is. he is by how much? Three and a half years. And who does better financially, you or him? <laughs> the same. So do you have he's a? Got, he's got a couple better stock picks. So do you have a better boat than he does? Same boat. Oh, so you share the boat. Same boat. Three so brothers. it's not real. Three brothers. Mm -hmm. And what's your profession? I'm the CEO of that real estate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have your ass fired. <laughs> so I want to get to language here. And I'll show you a couple more things, then I do want to take questions from you. With, with the situation that we're in right... Oh, oh, handheld. But I'm done with this now. Here, hold this. Thank you for that. Um, he must be union, by the way. A little, little late, a little not enough, but... As much... That, by the way, ensures that I cannot start my car this afternoon, what I just did right there. Um, what do we want from people? What do we want from financial services? What do we want from corporations? As much as we believe in innovation, right now, experience, knowledge, and wisdom. We want predictability. We want to know that what we are promised is exactly what we will get. We would like them to exceed expectations, but at least we want what they promise. As good as innovation and fresh thinking is, experience, knowledge, and the most important word up there, wisdom. We are looking for intelligence at a time when we're very much afraid. And as much as we want things that are big, I hate this phrase, strategic partner. Whoever created it doesn't understand how people think. Liability is the most important attribute. Once again, you say what you mean, mean what you say, and you always deliver. Uh, I'm going to go to some... Fr oh, I love this, by the way. I made this slide three days before she died. Gene Stapleton just passed away, and I was trying to, trying to figure out how to use pop culture. So there's a warning here. If your picture ever appears on my slide, <laughs> bad things are going to happen to you. I'll read it for those of you in the back. The reason you don't understand me, Edith, is because I'm talking to you in English, and you are listening to me in dingbat. So often, we don't think of what we're saying or how people hear it. And I want to show you examples right here should we relax environmental standards to produce energy by three to two the answer is no should we relax government regulations to produce energy overwhelmingly the answer is yes what's the difference an environmental standard is a safety net 
A government regulation is a bureaucracy. It's red tape. How you, how you create it. And by the way, you don't even know this. This work was done for your company. Ooh. How about this one? Welfare, by two to one, we think we spend too much money on welfare. By seven to one, we spend too little money on assistance to the poor. What the heck is welfare? Let me show you. Which is cleaner, drilling for oil or exploring for energy? Who says drilling for oil? Raise your hands. One person over there. My God, what do you do, work for Exxon? <laughs> you do, do you work for an oil company? No. Uh, which would you rather have? A voucher or an opportunity scholarship? Which would you rather have? Equal opportunity in education or school choice? Which angers you more, an estate tax or a death tax? These, there are words and phrases that really do have an impact, and so often we don't focus on them. Specific examples, when you tell people everyone wins, they know it's not true because everyone doesn't win in life. I'm going down to see the Florida Marlins tonight. I am sure that everyone is not gonna win that game. <laughs> and I am sure that the people who aren't gonna win that game are the Florida Marlins. Oh, it's true, great stadium, bad team. But if you say everyone benefits, that they can see. They can see that, that there is something good for everybody. Or ev no one cheats as the negative. Everyone follows the rules as the positive. Stop using the word capitalism. Because when I say capitalism, you hear Wall Street. You hear greed. You hear profit. But when you talk about economic freedom, you hear opportunity and you think Main Street. One more. The single best mission we've ever seen in business all of the language there is great, but I want to point out the bottom six words. Total alignment, for those of you in financial services, for those of you who are in consumer services. Total alignment means that you're on their side, they're on your side, you're all working for the same goal. Total commitment says that you're going to do it 24-7, 365 days a year. You are all about making it happen, and no excuses is the two best words to articulate accountability. And no one uses this. So take it. I mean, it's, it's yours. These are words that work. Now, I want to, because you want me to do questions, so I want to go to visuals. I'll show you one more thing, and then we'll do the questions, and it's right there. This is the most powerful visual. The business community is boring, and your visuals are really dull and dry, and they shouldn't be. When you ask the American people what is the best definition of pride and patriotism, what structure represents America to them, that's what they choose. Where is she made? France. France, but we think of her as American. By the way, when I think of the you know, Statue of Liberty, she's got one arm up holding the torch. When I think of the French, I think something a little more like this. <laughs> so I do this in a speech that I did in Hong Kong because I'm an idiot and I want to be fun. I want to get a laugh. And I'm sitting up on stage and there are a couple of French guys sitting where the two of you are. And I'm about as far away from you as, as I am here. And they're angry because the French have no sense of humor. Is anyone here born in France? Okay, we can be honest with each other. They do have no sense of humor. <laughs> so I come off the stage because I want to apologize because I don't want to offend anyone. I want people to pay attention so if you make them laugh every five or seven minutes, they'll listen to the whole thing. So I get to about this far from them and they're chattering back and forth and yapping in French. And all I could think of is Peter Sellers and the Pink Panther. <laughs> so I start to laugh. They're now totally offended. They stand up and they walked right out the center aisle. So I said, the only thing that came to my mind at that moment, you see the French, they're always in retreat. <laughs> the Germans in the room thought that was the funniest thing they ever heard. <laughs> and I thought it was kind of ironic that a Jew is entertaining the Germans. So <laughs> we're all happy. So how do you want? I want to make you happy. Frank, we, first we want to give you a round of applause. Outstanding. Thank you, Thank you very much. We're not going to do Q&A at all? Pardon me? We're not going to do Q&A no, at all? I'm giving this now, and then we're going to do the questions. Oh, okay. You're a great strategic partner. Glad. <laughs> Does it explain? Are really listening, people? Know. Okay. So, to our, uh, let's first, if you have your cards, we're going to run in short on time, but wave them in the air. We'll try to get them. And to the students, let's go. Two questions. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stefan Arellis. Um, I'm currently attending Palm Beach State College. 
I'm part of the Honors College in Phi Theta Kappa. I'm currently uh, majoring in Human Resources and Management. And uh, my question for you today, Dr. Luntz, is uh, your book, Win, makes clear that following the rules of effective communication is indispensable in any successful human end of war. When a prospective client comes to the firm for help in preparing a communication plan, does your firm examine the client's motives? And also, has your firm ever declined to work with a prospective client? Uh, yes, we have, we have declined about 20%, I'd say, of the people that come to us wanting us to work for them. We declined a very, we declined a multi, multi-million dollar Middle Eastern account because it was antithetical to the things that I believed in. And I could have bought the 39-foot boat and another 79-foot boat with it. I couldn't do it. I don't sleep to begin with. I'm, I work until 3 or 4 in the morning. I don't want to be awake because of guilt. That's the answer to the first one. The answer to the second one is their intent matters as much as, as anything they may do. One of the things I've learned in the work that I've done is that people will forgive mistakes if the intent is right. They're going to feel better about a company with good intent, even if the result isn't as good, than those who have better results but bad intent. And so intent really does matter. The other thing is how open are they? Uh, I am this way with everybody that I work with, and it rubs about 10% of the people that I work with the wrong way. Every time I do speeches like this, 10% walk out angry at me. And I take the red, like her, right, right there. She's... <laughs> But I'm not in it for the 10%. I'm in it for the 90%. Uh, and for you, for human resources, you may be in one of the most important positions over the next 30 years because this coming generation, the people who are in their 20s, have a different outlook on life than the people that they will work with and work for. And it is going to be a struggle for you because you're going to be dealing with people who expect an awful lot and won't necessarily realize how much time and effort has to go into achieving those expectations. So I thank you for the position that you're in. You're going to be well rewarded for it. You're going to bust your ass for it, too. <laughs> thank you. One more from the kids? Yes, correct. Students? Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Baldeo, and I'm a nursing student at Palm Beach State College in the Honors College, and my question is, from all of your surveys, what are the chances of a comprehensive immigration bill passing this year? Uh, I give your senator from this state, Mr. Rubio, an awful lot of credit because he may be giving up his presidential hopes in an effort to try to get that immigration through. Uh, there are two sticking points right now. I don't care what you read in the newspaper. The two sticking points is the difference between legal status and citizenship. For permanent legal status, without citizenship, they could get that right now. But the Obama administration wants citizenship, not legal status. The second aspect of it is the President's health care proposal. That is a huge sticking point for Republicans in the House. For people who came here illegally and have been here legally for years, Republicans do not want to expand health care coverage to them because of how expensive it will be. Democrats do want to expand health care coverage. If they compromise on those two items, you will have immigration reform this year of the nature that you expect. I do not think they're going to compromise on either of them, which makes me think that immigration reform is less likely. Both of those good questions. Thank you to our students. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> So I have almost 10 after and want to make sure people have plenty of time to shake your hand and get your autograph. So we'll go to like 20 after, so 10 minutes of questions here. Done. So I know you like to talk, but we'll try to get through lots of these. That's a shot. <laughs> okay, let's talk about FPL's rates. So do talk radio and cable TV news shows hinder the, the effort for bipartisanship on both sides of the aisle? This is exactly what got me into all sorts of trouble. Are any of you familiar? I'm just curious to see if anyone re you reads the blogs. Are anyone familiar with this question and me? You wrote us, you are familiar. Uh, I take my relationship with my students incredibly seriously. I don't want to downplay a conversation like this. And there's a camera there. I say stuff that is really on the edge to begin with. But when I have students in the room, there is no filter. 
I'd tell them exactly what I think because I was a professor at Harvard and I was a professor at Penn. And to me, that was a sacred relationship. And when the door was shut, I told them everything because I wanted them to really understand it. I believe in that kind of academic give and take. And I told them that there are elements of talk radio that are very bad for trying to get things done in Washington. And I named a couple of names, and I went through hell for the next two weeks. Um, I think there are a lot more forces right now that divide us than unite us. I was kidding when I said that I can't tell jokes here, but I know that every time I do, I get myself into all sorts of trouble. And it's never, when someone complains about a joke, I had people complain about the stuff I said about John McCain, and there were people who voted for McCain. I had people complain about what I said about Hillary Clinton, and they voted for Hillary Clinton. So it's a joke if it's somebody else, but it's not a joke if it's making fun of your own person. That's not the way it used to be. It's, that's not how we used to operate. We have to find organizations, and this is a great one. I looked at your list. My God, the people that you have coming here, the people that you get a chance to interact with, brilliant. It doesn't happen that way in Washington. You know this, you're a former congressman. Republicans and Democrats in D.C. don't even talk to each other. They don't socialize with each other. I spend at least 25% of my time with the people of the other party. And when my party hears about it, they ask me why. And my response back is, why not? You have a responsibility in this room to teach your children about civility and decency. You have a responsibility to teach them that not everyone will agree with you or agree with them. And that not only should you respect alternative points of view, you should seek them out. I learned so much more by sitting at a table with people who disagree with me than sitting at a table who agree with me. And the fact that an organization like this, that you can have people from all walks of life, with all different positions, and you treat them with respect, this is what's good about America. I don't know about talk radio, but this is what's good about America. So we got a lot of questions about uh, Republicans, uh, you know, focus and core principles. So They're old. The average age of a Republican now is deceased. <laughs> Can I, I want to answer, even though you didn't ask it, I want to explain Obama Romney. And I can do it, and you can time it in 60 seconds. Obama was able to prove to the American people that he understood what they were going through. But he couldn't show that he could solve it. Mitt Romney was able to show that he was a problem solver, but he was never able to communicate that he understood their problems. And in the end, the American people wanted someone who understood them even more than someone who could solve the challenges that they were facing. Mitt Romney beat Barack Obama on almost every single issue according to the exit polls. Obama beat Mitt Romney on one attribute by 82 to 18, understands the problems of people like me. Until the Republicans learn how to empathize, until they learn how to listen, until they ask questions before they give answers, they will not win the White House. It is that level, it is that deep. And I'm looking around this room, and this is not America. If you look around at who's here, the Republicans are going to have to be able to appeal to a 21-year-old, not just a 61-year-old. They're going to have to appeal to Hispanics, to Latinos, not by giving up on their philosophy, but by explaining that that philosophy has more in common. And at this point, I would not be optimistic. The Senate leader, Mitch McConnell, he went through eight hours of open heart surgery because it took him six hours just to find his heart. <laughs> John Boehner, you've noticed the, John, the color of John Boehner, he's got that different color skin. He cries a lot. It's got to be rust. <laughs> so since we're talking about Barack and, and Mitt, uh, were your focus, focus groups on Fox in 2012 designed to give Republicans false hope? No. In fact, any of you who know the background, Bill Maher, I, I, I went on Bill Maher on the 15th of October and I specifically said to him, I want to do your show because it's good for selling books, but you may not ask me only one question. Only one question is off limits. Who's going to win the election? I come out, audience applauds. So Frank, you're the Nostradamus of pollsters. Who's going to win this election? <laughs> I wanted to use a four-letter word because on HBO you can use a four-letter word. To describe him, I had the answer to the question. And for me, I thought it was a lifetime because I paused. You can't tell on television. It actually looks like I answered it immediately. In my head, it was forever. And I said, Barack Obama. And from that moment for the last two weeks, I had hell with the people that I had to deal with in parts of my life because they thought I was a traitor. But in the end, a pollster 
has to tell the truth. And I met with some of the people, some well-known individuals, including some who have a home here, a well-known family that has a home here, and I told him that Obama was going to win. And the word then went out, and there was a financial consequence to that. I have to, don't cut me off. <laughs> I can hear it. <gasps> you paused. Don't, yes. <laughs> Yeah, and stop cutting off people who pay late their, their rates already. I mean, come on. Shouldn't have given you my card. Yes. And you've got to give me one last question. Um, you have to tell the truth. And you have to tell the truth no matter what. And again, this, I go back to you kids over there. And you're not kids, you're young adults, I can see that. But I go back to you. It is far better to be a truth teller and take momentary abuse than it is to tell people what they want to hear and not be able to live with yourself. Uh, so. Last one. So, no, I, want, I want to do two more. Uh, the one that I want to ask, I didn't see come through, but Dave Ehrenberg was up here talking with you about this before lunch, about our governor's race that's going to be coming up in Florida. What do you make of the Democratic position on that, perhaps Charlie Crist or perhaps Senator Nelson, and, and what do you think of Governor Scott's? I, I don't know what to make of Charlie Crist, because I don't know, it, it, what party is he with today? <laughs> This is a man who's got more flexibility than Kathy Rigby and whatever those. <laughs> I, I don't know where he stands. He, he really does look like a politician that follows the polls. And I have a problem. As a pollster, I have a problem with that. I want to help people communicate. I don't want to help them make up their minds. On the Republican side, Rick Scott is not a good communicator. I can show you a significant record of accomplishment, but I'm looking at 2012 here in Florida. That people will say that he did a decent job, but they don't like him. And it's not too late for him to change, but it's becoming. You're getting very close. People don't make up their mind on Election Day anymore. They make up their mind far before. He's got to figure out a way to go back and be who he was when he was running for office. Because he stay, if he stays the, as a communicator as he's doing now, he will be defeated. Last question. Have you been targeted for an IRS audit? audit? <laughs> Well, up until this moment, no. Uh, no, I've never been audited by the IRS, uh, and I thank God. And actually, it's one of the, another piece of advice I give you all, because some of you have been very successful in life. I said to my accountant, I don't want to be, I don't even want to hear about it. If I get audited, I don't want you to play near, near the edges. I'm so grateful to live in this country, and I've done perfectly well, that I don't need the extra few dollars, or hundred dollars, or thousands, or whatever it is. I don't want the fear or the embarrassment, but the idea that this government would play politics with the IRS, it was wrong when Richard Nixon did it, and it's wrong when Barack Obama did it, and I expect Democrats to stand up and say, this is not right. Just as you expect Republicans to stand up and say that their leadership is too partisan and too political and doesn't reflect doesn't empathize with people. You have the right to expect that the Democrats stand up and say that the government tools like the IRS should not be used for political reasons. We have to demand accountability from all sides. We have to demand solutions and results and problem solving from our sides. We are first and foremost, not Democrats or Republicans, we are first and foremost Americans. Let's act that way. Thank you. Frank, thank you very much. Thank we appreciate you. you joining us today.